when it's four degrees outside, it only makes sense to review this movie. Okay, everybody, today we're going all the way back to 1951 to review a classic little gem that everybody knows, everybody loves. Is it overrated? Is it underrated? Well, that's why we're here to take a look. We're going all the way back and checking out The Thing from Another World. Anyway, before we go any further, before we dive into this gem anymore, once again, and as always, to the trailer. Is it human or inhuman? Earthly or unearthly? Baffling questions, astounding questions that not even the world's greatest scientific minds can answer. Gentlemen, do you realize what we've found? A being from another world as different from us as one pole from the other. If we can only communicate with it. See? What happened, Doctor? In the greenhouse I was working, I couldn't see. Yeah. Then, then a blast of cold air and I heard Olsen scream. Come here. Get in the corner. Now hold this in front of you. Stay by the light switch. 1.9. Needles hit the top. Okay, this motion picture was directed by Christian Nyby. Nyby, 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 it doesn't make a difference. Now, I know what everybody's thinking. Wasn't this thing directed by Howard Hawks? Well, maybe, depending on who you ask. See, this motion picture has had a long, clouded history about who really directed it. From the best I can make out, Nyby directed it, Hawks was on the scene, and he was given a lot of suggestions, and Christian was asking for a lot of advice. Let's just put it that way. Now, anyway, we'll take a look back at his record and see what he's done. He was really a TV guy. Did a bunch of things here, a bunch of things there. Some stuff you probably won't remember, but here we go. We're talking about he did The Wagon Train and Perry Mason and Rawhide and Gunsmoke and Private Secretary and It's a Great Life and The Lone Wolf and The Adventures of Jim Bowie and The Roy Rogers Show and Gilligan's Island and Bonanza and FBI and Emergency and Lassie and even Adam 12? If anybody even remembers Adam 12, am I the only person old enough to remember Adam's? Whatever, whatever, whatever. Let's get going to the cast. Playing Captain Patrick Hendry, Kenneth Toby. You all know I love when I see Kenneth Toby pop up in a motion picture, especially one where he gets to play like the leading man instead of always playing some kind of an asshole. But let's just take a look back at his career. We are talking about he was in Billy Jack. He was in Dirty Mary Crazy Larry and Airplane and It Came From Beneath the Sea and Walking Tall and Big Top Pee Wee and Strange Invaders and Ben and Gus and The Howling for Christ's sake and... Uh, Again, so many TV shows, I'm not even going to list them all. Just name a TV show, and at one point or another, he popped up in it. Just the way it is. Playing Nikki, Margaret Sheridan. Oh, yeah. Now, she didn't really have a long career. She really settled into family life and didn't really take off in a big way. But she was in Stuff Soft. She was in this. She was in I, the Jury, and The Diamond Wizard, and Pride of Blue Grass, and uh, One Minute to Zero, and on TV, you know, Wagon Train. City Detective. She was in some stuff. Not a long list. Pretty short career. But she wanted to be a family-oriented person. And God bless her for it. Playing Dr. Carrington, Roger Corthwaite. Doesn't jump out at you, but we're going to name some things. He was in stuff like... 
whatever happened to Baby Jane, and the War of the Worlds, and a Future World, and Colossus the Forbidden Project, and Reptilicus, and a Day of the Outlaw, and Hell on Devil's Island, and when it came to TV, again, like Ken and Toby, he was on everything. And I think he was active in the business for like 45 years, and he was in over 200 things. So the man was out there. The man had a big career. Again, not a name you're going to know, but if you look at him, you're like, son of a bitch. Yeah. Playing Ned Scotty Scott, Douglas Spencer. Let's take a look. Anyway, he was in stuff like This Island Earth and Shane and The Diary of Aunt Frank and The Unholy Wife and uh, The Glass Wall and Monkey Business and Warpath and The Redhead and the Cowboy and uh, Follow Me Quietly. And he was on TV stuff like, you know, Bonanza and The Twilight Zone. He died at only 50 years old. So again, his career could have went on to be bigger. He's a good actor. But, you know, heart attack, diabetes, the whole problem is what it was. Lost him early. Playing Dr. Stern, Edward Franz. Let's take a look. He was in stuff like The Iron Curtain and The Ten Commandments and Atari and uh, Beauty and the Beast and Day of the Bad Man and The Last Command and The Jazz Singer. Not the one with Neil Diamond, but the first one. And One Minute to Zero and uh, uh, the talk Francis the Talking Mule and tons and tons and tons of TV. Everything from Zorro to Breaking Point. So, he was around a lot. Kind of have a distinct face. Keep an eye out. And starring as The Thing itself. James Arness, tall in stature, pretty sizable career. We're talking he was in Them. We're talking he was in Hondo, in The Sea Chase, in The Long Hand, in Hellgate, but really a TV guy, a TV guy. How the West Was Won, McLean's Law, and obviously what he is most known for to everybody, Gunsmoke. Does anybody remember Gunsmoke? If you don't, go look it up. You're missing out. Is what it was. Let's keep moving. Okay, everybody, we're going to do this in 90 seconds or less. Keep it short, keep it fast, keep it entertaining, keep it moving, so we get to what we would much rather be the summation. I'm really going to keep it short, because let's face it, this is an alien from outer space movie. We don't have to go too far, but let's get rolling. You're hanging out. You're at this uh, Air Force base in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh huh. And there's this reporter trooping around, this guy, Scott, he's just dying for a story. And he winds up talking to, you know, Captain. Patrick Hendry and his guys, and they're all sitting around, shooting the breeze, playing some cards, whatever. But then Patrick gets called in by the big man in charge, and he says, hey, there's some stuff going up at the North Pole. Dr. Carrington says he needs you guys up there. He thinks a plane crashed. Well, oh, Captain Pat says, okay, we're on our way. His boys start teasing him, because up there happens to be an old flame and a hot dame, as they would say back in the day, that he was associated with, but... They razz them, they tease them, they all hop on the plane, and they go. They get there, and of course, Captain Pat is reunited with Nikki. And you find out that they had like a kind of a quasi-date, and she left them hanging. Is what it was, as as it went. So, you go out to talking to Dr. Carrington. Dr. Carrington says something came down, but it didn't come down right. It didn't seem like a meteor would come down right, and it's very heavy. Let's all go on a plane and look. They go, they go to find this thing, they find it. For no apparent reason, they say the only way to get it out of ice is to put these thermite charges and just blow it up, which they blow it up too far and they blow it up, but they do fine. An alien being hanging out by the side of the ship, well, frozen in a big block of ice that they somehow chop out in less than an hour, pop in their airplane, and they go back to the North Pole base. When they get there, they're all keeping an eye on it. They're watching it. They're seeing what's going on. But one of the boys, aside of checking this thing out, decided that the heating blanket he was wearing would be better to cover up the face of this creature because he got tired of staring at it. It melted the ice, and before you know it, the big boy is on the loose. Well, turns out this thing isn't really man. He is not animal. He's a big walking veggie. Uh-huh, a vegetable itself. So you can't really shoot it. You can't really hurt it. You can't really do anything to it. And this veggie likes to be watered. And what does it get watered with? Oh, yeah, blood. It likes blood. Doggy blood, human blood, doesn't matter. It needs blood, and it is out of searching. Well, you know, head scientist Dr. Carrington, he's really upset. He's like, you can't hurt this thing. This is the find of the millennium, the century of all times. It doesn't make a difference. He's trying to save this thing's life. And all the military guys are like, no, nah, screw that shit. This thing's going to die. We're going to turn it to a giant french fry. It's just the way it's going to go. They try setting this thing on fire, but it doesn't really work. They're saying to themselves, how? Can we take this creature out? Before you know it, the creature says, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to freeze these people to death. I'm going to destroy 
the oil supply, and these guys are all going to start dying in the cold, which is always kind of what happens. But they come up with another idea. Whew, man, we're going to have to take this thing out with some electricity and fry his ass to death like he was in some modern microwave. I'm not going to tell you what happens after that. I'm going to tell you that's all I'm going to give you, basically. But that's just the story. You follow it. You get the idea. It is what it was. You got the captain. You got his ex-girlfriend. They're kind of talking. And in the middle of all this, you have this giant alien running around that's basically a large carrot. Okay, everybody, does the thing from another planet work? Yes, it works. It's a fun romp. It's one of those great little sci-fi horror movies from the early 50s that has become legendary. Can you compare it to the remake that old Carpenter and his crew did several decades later? Not really. But that's not what we're really here to look at. But we will touch on that more later. Before we go any further, let's get the big three out of the way. The directing, it's solid. It's decent. It's pretty good, actually. It keeps you in the moment. Looks good on camera. Nothing too bad. This is a movie I don't think they had, like, you know, let's face it, like the world's biggest budget. This wasn't like, you know, the War of the Worlds or something where they really went all out. But they did the best with what they had. And for what they had, they made it look and work fairly well. So the directing, on point. The dialogue, it's solid. It might be a little bit too cheerful and jokey in places for a movie like this. We'll touch on that later. But the dialogue is solid and well written. It's a short movie. It's only like an hour and 20 something minutes. And it keeps a pretty brisk pace. But you don't feel like you're missing anything because the dialogue and the techno babble that all the uh, scientists are always sprouting around and the military guys are throwing out there, it works. So the writing is good. The acting. Solid cast. Everybody pulls it off. Yes, the scientist could be a little bit of a too typical, tight-assed, you know, I just want to just protect life. All this life. Yes, he's that guy. It's a little bit of a cartoon cutout. But remember, when this motion picture was made, this is the movie that created those cartoon cutouts that got mimicked later. So, the acting is solid. The acting is good. Yes, it has a little bit of that 50s flair. What are we going to do, Captain? How are we going to stop this thing? Well, Timmy, I don't know, but we're going to... It has a little bit of that, and that might affect your modern-day viewing pleasure just a tad. But if you keep it in its proper perspective, the acting is solid and good. Now, what makes this motion picture work? Let's be honest. It just delivers. It's a solid, quick-paced, as I always talk about pacing, well-done motion picture that doesn't waste a lot of time, but gives you enough time with the characters so that you care about them, so that you feel like you know them, and then gets these three or four really good scenes involving James Arness as the thing. And even when he's not being on camera, you get the eerie presence that he's lurking around, that he's out there. They keep him with the Geiger counters, you know, being tracked like that, almost like, you know, they did in Aliens or something when they were watching the things and you couldn't see them, but you knew they were there. They kind of like borrowed that basically from this. And even if he's not on camera, he's lurking and you know where he is by the little machine. So there's this omnipresent vibe that goes on through most of the motion picture so that even if he's not there, he's there. And it moves at a quick enough pace so that it never slows down and gets boring, but it never runs so quick that you're sitting there saying, oh man, they're just flying to this, trying to get from shot to shot and get us the hell out of here. It's paced well, it's delivered well. And of course, you have the uh, other angle on this that is taking place on the North Pole. So you do have that like isolated feel, like nobody's going to come and help these people. There's a storm outside, they're having problems radioing out, they're having problems radioing in, and there's nobody really to get to these group of people. Yes, unlike the Carpenter version, where you only had like a little teeny group of guys, like 10 or 12, whatever the hell it was, this one feels like there's a, a bit more people there, and there's a couple of ladies there, and all that kind of stuff, but that doesn't make you feel like they're not still in an isolated location, fighting the elements, fighting the alien, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, okay, there might be a few more people than you're used to seeing if you're thinking the thing from 82, but it's still well done, and it still gives you a bit of that isolated feeling. And also, this is a motion picture that is a space par thing or whatever like that. But it's not so intense. It can't be sort of a family flick for all intents and purposes. It's 1951. Except for him fighting a couple of dogs and you hear about what he did to a couple of scientists <laughs> like that. 
It's not so, it's not like Carpenter's the thing where like, you know, if somebody isn't of a certain age, get them the hell out of here. I'm not saying this movie is for kids by any stretch of the imagination, but it is not so gory or, you know, just over the top that, you know, if somebody walks through the room at 11 years old or something, they're going to be freaked out. It's not that kind of a flick. Now, are there any problems with this motion picture? I, I, I've said it a million times. There's problems with every motion picture. Well, except for John Carpenter's The Thing. But there's problems with every motion picture. This one, there's a few little quips. I mean, the idea that the captain's just going to blow this spaceship up out of the ice without taking three seconds of forethought before he does it. Okay. The idea that they somehow only had an hour to get out of there before the storm and they chop out with axes this giant block of ice and get it on the airplane. Okay. And there's a little bit of maybe too much light banter here and there while they're in the middle of this high-level stress situation. You know what I mean? There's always a moment where everything is taking place, people are being killed, yet somebody has enough time to sit there and say, well, whatever you say, Doc, you know what I mean? And that kind of a thing, where they're almost like, it doesn't have that tension of the remake like you're used to. It doesn't have that sheer stark bleakness of the remake like you're thinking. It doesn't have those things that the other one had. This one kind of feels like, hey, there's some stuff happening, but we got this under control. Blah, blah, blah. We'll take care of it. And away we go. Everybody's got a grin on occasion. Everybody's got a smile. Everybody's still making jokes about the captain and Nikki. Everybody is still doing that kind of a vibe. So, yes, it might seem a little out of place, now, for its time, it wasn't that bad, and it's not laid on that thick. But you'll get it, you'll see what I mean, and you'll roll along. And since we are obviously going to make a few comparisons to the 82 version, the 82 version was an all-male cast. There's 12 guys or whatever it was thrown at the, the North Pole, and hey, you know, they're, we're Antarctica. And they're sitting there, and they're dealing with this situation. This is a little bit more complicated because you have a love interest, you have a love story, you have a couple of female characters, great female characters by the way, you know what I mean? Don't anybody let them, don't anybody get all out of whack thinking, well this is going to be a 1950s version of women and it's going to be, it's not like that for the love of God, you know the Nikki character, she's strong, she's smart, a lot of ways she's sometimes running circles around the captain, but not all the time. It's still one of those movies where guys are guys and girls are girls, la 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 la. All that kind of shit. But she's still strong, intelligent. He's strong, intelligent. And they're sitting there and they make this team with everybody else, obviously, and take on the big, scary fried potato or whatever the hell this guy is. So, yes, it's a little bit of a different dichotomy. It's not an all-male, super dark movie, and there's, this one's a little bit lighter and all that kind of stuff, but still enjoyable. Also, I think one thing else that needs to be said about this, for a low-budget-ish kind of a motion picture, it's got a great soundtrack. I mean, when the motion, motion picture starts out, and it starts out with the Thing logo that they blatantly basically copied and put in the 82 version, and you see that thing, and you're there, you're like, oh, man. I mean, I'm in already. I don't even know what the hell is going on. I'm in already. So, the soundtrack is good. Acting is good. Contemporary for its time. The writing is solid. The story is decent. Again, it varies from the original novel or novella, if you will, Who Goes There, which really Carpenter's version stuck more to. A shape-shifting, you don't know who is good and who is bad, who is real and who is not. They couldn't do this. It's 1951. You know what I mean? So they took the alien and dumped all that shit and they made him a big giant vegetable and it was what it was. But it's still effective. It's still fun. It's still a motion picture you should check out. And if you haven't seen it, what the hell is wrong with you? All right, everybody, be good, take care, and stay out of trouble. Be kind to a stranger, be there for a friend. But more than anything else, never, ever take any bullshit from anybody. And get out there and watch the thing from another world. It's a classic. If you're young, don't let black and white films scare you. Get out there and enjoy this thing. It's well worth the watch.